I am Pamela Smith. I am the um, director of the Center for Science and Society. And um, we are, as you can see by my kind of giddiness, we are celebrating this evening tonight because we are both in person and um, on Zoom. It's our first hybrid event since we began this series, Climate and Society, last year. So I was saying that we launched this series because of the founding of the Climate School in 2021, last year. And we realized that there really needed to be a forum for um, considering climate from many different interdisciplinary um, perspectives. And especially because the Climate School is supposed to be a hub of interdisciplinary research, education, and um, practice. So, um, you know, we thought the Center for the Science and Society is a good place to start this. We have many um, co-sponsors, including the Climate and Society MA, um, the, uh, the Dean of the Office of the Dean of the Humanities, the Climate School itself, and Lamont Doherty um, Earth Observatory. So we have had many distinguished speakers come in over the last year. And this semester, we decided to do this series slightly differently. We wanted to have Columbia researchers in conversation. So um, our first event last month was on um, co-production of knowledge with a whole group of speakers. And we are very happy tonight to have um, two very distinguished um, speakers with us here. So you can see that we have many events scheduled for the spring. Some of them will be um, catch up speaker series from last semester, and some of them will be these Columbia researcher conversations. Um, you can register on our website. Um, you can sign up for our newsletter, please do. And our Zoom attendees today can participate in today's conversation by submitting questions in the chat. Um, Hopefully all of you will remember still how to raise your hand and actually ask questions. I must say, I'm still a little confused about how to do these hybrid events and even in person. Um, okay, so now I'd like to introduce our really wonderful speakers, um, wonderful creative speakers tonight, um, Gisela Winkler and Jorge Otero Payos. Each will speak for about 20 minutes and then we'll respond to each other's presentations um, up here in the front. And then we'll have uh, plenty of time for um, engaging audience questions and discussion. So our first speaker this evening is Gisela Winkler. Dr. Winkler is a climate scientist and isotope geochemist at Columbia University's Lamont Doherty Earth Observatory, where she serves as the associate director of the geochemistry division. Her research focuses on the history and the causes of climate variability in the past, present, and future. She uses elemental and isotopic analyses to unravel processes of climate and environmental change in the oceans and on continents on timescales ranging from decades to tens of millions of years. Her research on the interplay of climate change, biochemical cycles, and aerosols uses climate archives such as deep sea sediments lake sediments, and polar ice cores from Antarctica and Greenland. Dr. Winkler has received numerous awards, had published over hundreds of peer-reviewed scientific papers, and she has served as the climate scientist, scientist in residence at Columbia's Journalism School and is interested in fostering innovative ways of connecting science, art, journalism, and design, as well as climate activism and outreach. She's deeply engaged in the JETI initiative, the Justice, Equity, Diversity, and Inclusion space. And she has served as co-chair of the Lamont Doherty Equity and Inclusion Task Force. She currently teaches, uh, co-teaches a seminar on climate change, race, and environmental justice. Our second speaker is Jorge Otero Palos. Um, professor Otero Palos is director and professor of historic preservation at the Columbia University Graduate School of Architecture. He studied architecture at Cornell University and earned a doctorate in architecture at MIT. He is a New York-based artist, architect, and preservationist, best known for making monumental casts of historically uh, charged buildings. He draws from his formal training in architecture to create artworks that address themes of memory, history, and transition, inviting the viewer to consider monuments as powerful agents for cultural connection 
questioning and understanding. Professor Otero Pailos employs the material residues of our modernity um, in order to um, draw out their meanings. His site-specific series, The Ethics of Dust, is an ongoing investigation resulting from cleaning dust and the residues of pollution from monuments all over the world. His latest projects include preserving airborne, airborne dust in the atmosphere, saving the perimeter security fence of the ex-US embassy in Oslo, um, and immersing visitors' bodies in a soundscape composed with New York State's main water bodies at Lyndhurst Estates Historical Swim Tank. So you can see from these two very interesting speakers that we are going to have a wonderful conversation tonight. So I'd like to invite um, uh, Dr. Winkler up to the podium first. You know, so it's really exciting um, to be here and to partner with Jorge on this. We met about a year ago, actually on one of these round table discussions, and I was blown away, pun intended, um, <laughs> by you know, meeting somebody who was as fascinated as I am of dust, you know, which you don't, <laughs> you know, happen to do all the time. And so I've been fascinated by his work and by our conversation that we've been having ever since. And so this is a very exciting day and I'm grateful for the center, for you, Pamela, and for you all to be here to actually share this conversation with us. Now, dust. <laughs> What is dust? Um, the scientific term of dust is actually sort of a collection of tiny particles of material suspended in the air. Um, I've just recently come across a new definition that is so beautiful that it took my breath away when I saw it the first time. It's dust is particulate matter the dispersed, disordered, raw material from which everything ordered and coherent arises, and it is to dust that the complex decays. That really is dust, you know, not the scientific um, definition that I read to you earlier. And this is from a book that I just recently came across from a serendipitous conversation with Caroline Maxwell, a student at the School of the Arts who happened to be on a visit at Lamont, and he told me that this is what she's working on. She's working on the Book of Dust by Agnes Dines, which is just the most amazing piece of art, you know, I've seen in a long, long time. Um, so that was really fascinating and cool. And when I put this together, these slides, I actually asked myself, what are you all sort of thinking of and associating with the term dust. And I thought maybe it is these stunning images of the dust ball in the 1930s in the Southwest. Um, maybe it is these stunning descriptions of the dust ball. This is a quote from John Steinbeck's The Grapes of Wrath. Um, Houses were shut tight and glass wedges around doors and windows, but the dust came in so thinly that it could not be seen in the air and it settled like pollen on the chairs and tables, on the dishes, which I find, you know, sort of you, you, you get this feeling that the dust is coming into the room while you um, read this. Or perhaps it's images like this, these satellite images from NASA that show you this vast scale of dust storms. This is an example of the Sahara blowing into the Atlantic thousands of kilometers and just these huge phenomena on our planet. Or perhaps it's something mundane like, you know, little red grains on, the, on your car's windshield. The study of dust is nothing new. It's been actually around for a long time. This is an example from Darwin, who was one of the pioneers actually of, of dust research on his Beagle journey. And in 1832, he wrote, generally the atmosphere is hazy, and this is caused by the falling of impalpably fine dust, which was found to have injured our astronomical instruments. That seems to have been his main worry. But he describes this dust, and he describes these um, the dust storms. And then he actually describes that he collected a little packet of this brown colored fine dust which is pretty much exactly what we do today. 
Um, this is a photo of one of these original samples, you know, that are still available, still archived. And there's current research that's being done on these samples from the early 19th century. There's a paper that came out maybe 10 years ago on living microbes from these original samples that Darwin um, sampled. Um, back into the present. This. Oops. Yeah. yeah, this is an animation of a global atmospheric model that shows you all types of dusts that there are. So you have these orange reddish colors, that's the mineral dust from deserts. Like, you know, the biggest one is the Sahara that swirls around the globe. You have the blues here, the blues are the uh, is sea salt that actually gets emitted from the ocean surface in cyclones. These are these beautiful swirls, particularly in the more windy oceans like the Southern Ocean. The green is um, aerosols, dusts that get emitted from burning fires. And the whites will be very important when Jorge you know, takes over. Those are sulfates, those are industrial aerosols from industrial activity. So power plants, um, factories, right? These anthropogenic human-made aerosols that are particularly prevalent in the Northern Hemisphere. Um, I love this animation. I think it's just wild how it captures this connectivity between the land, the air, and the ocean, this is probably as close to art, you know, that we get in the science community. Um, and it's also my secret psychedelic screensaver <laughs> that I can, you know, stare at for hours and hours and hours. Um, so to sum that up, there is natural sources of dusts. Um, as we've seen, deserts, volcanoes, the ocean surface, um, wildfires, and there is anthropogenic sources of dust. Um, and those are fossil fuel plants, industrial activity, but also um, wood stove um, cooking um, or transportation. And those, as I said, they will actually come back to you again, you know, when Jorge um, shows his beautiful work. Um, these are original images from his presentation from, you know, the early 20th century in Chicago, these industrial smokestacks that are emitting exactly those types of aerosols that um, um, we are talking about here. All right, so why do we care from a climate science perspective? Um, the reason why we care is because these aerosols, these dusts play an important role in the climate system. They are a very important agent in the climate system. And why is that? It's actually pretty simple. And you know, I think we can all imagine that particulate matter in the atmosphere um, will interact with the energy balance, with the radiative balance of the Earth system. So essentially what will happen is that solar radiation that comes to the Earth gets reflected back into space. And what that means is that the Earth gets cooler. So the more dust there is in the atmosphere, the less sunlight makes it to the surface of the Earth. And that's a cooling effect of these aerosols. So that's the first order basic effect. The other one is actually that these dust particles act as nucleation nuclei for clouds. Clouds don't just form from water vapor. They actually need a little thingy you know, to hold on to to actually make clouds. And dust particles, aerosols of all types, act as condensation nuclei. And the important piece to remember is here that both of these things cool the planet because they both tend to either in, increase the albedo, the reflectivity, or scatter um, solar radiation, which is sort of the power engine of the Earth. So keep that in mind, both cool. And we can see this actually in the data. Um, this is the temperature record, the mean global atmospheric temperature of the planet, sort of an IPCC type figure um, that goes from this here from 1880 to today, and each of these dots is the global mean temperature. And that shows you what you all know, that the Earth has been warming by about 1.1 degrees Celsius 
Celsius or about two degrees Fahrenheit. Doesn't sound like much, but is actually a disaster, you know, and we are sort of on the way of increasing that warming. Now, if you look at the attribution, at the different contributions where that overall temperature signal comes from, so the total is 1.1 degrees, and then we can actually tease this out, what contributes to that signal. And the major factor, so red here is positive, so that's warming. The blue bars are negative, cooling. The major ones are, like you all know, the greenhouse gases, carbon dioxide and methane. But you can see here that there's a pretty significant blue bar, a cooling bar here, in this same scale of effects on the global temperature. This one, and this is actually these anthropogenic aerosols from industrial activity, pollution. That's what it is. It's pollution in the air, and this is pretty significant. Um, and we can see this actually when we get back to that graph, same graph, if you look now particularly between, um, let's say, 1940 and 1975, you actually see that not much happened in temperature. The temperature is pretty stable. There isn't a whole lot of warming in these 30 or 40 years in between. Um, there were still greenhouse gases emitted. You know, that didn't stop. But there was so much pollution, so much of these dust in the air, that the cooling effect from these polluting particles actually masked the warming that we would have seen from greenhouse gases. And that's the reason why we have this plateau here where there isn't much warming. Then in sort of the mid seventies, um, legislation you know, um, came to effect like the Clean Air Act. We started cleaning up our atmosphere. We started cleaning up the pollution from um, the air. The number of these industrial aerosols went down and this is when the warming sort of kicked off um, to this even st um, steeper warming curve that you see at the end. So that gives you a sense of how important really globally these aerosols are sort of as an agent of climate change. Um, in other words, you know, simply speaking, it's if we didn't have the pollution, we would see much more warming, right? They mask, they compensate for the warming from other um, anthropogenic greenhouse gases. Now, this was all about sort of the last century or the modern. And now what I would like to do is take you on a journey back in time through the Earth history. So we are leaving sort of that space of the last century here, and we are going back in time, in fact, millions of years back in time. So we are following this blue arrow here, back, back, back to probably spaces that you rarely think about. Um, how do we do this? We do this by using climate archives. We have a whole variety of sort of tricks and tools to reconstruct climatic conditions of the past. I want to show you two different ones. One is ice cores. Ice cores are, you know, you see here a couple of pictures. These are these cylinders of ice, tubes of ice that get drilled into the ice sheet of Greenland and Antarctica. Um, about two miles thick. That's why I call them here the two mile time machines. They give us one of our best climate records over these time scales. Um, beautiful, you know, pieces of art. And um, this is an example of an ice core from Greenland where you can actually see this layer here. Um, you know, the, the, just to give you an illustration of what you can pick up from these ice cores. This is a volcanic eruption, a volcanic ash layer. 21,000 years ago that you can see, you know, right away microscopically with your eye. And then we can do reconstructions like this, which I also added because it relates to um, our overall conversation here. This is from a, an ice core in Northern Greenland here. And what you're seeing here, the time scale runs from the Iron Age, like, you know, about a thousand before common era to the early middle ages on, on the Y axis is the lead concentrations as measured in this remote ice core up here in northern Greenland. And that tells you a well-dated and exactly dated history of lead emissions um, that stem from mining and smelting operations actually in southern Spain, thousands of kilometers away. And it's this very detailed record that we can reconstruct from these ice cores that tell us about politics and 
economics and you know life um, through this time period. And the other climate archive that we have is marine sediments, ocean sediments that emerge from the ocean floor. This is one example, just a photo of the mud, you know, the diary of the Earth history um, that spans over different time periods. It can be just a few hundred years. It can be up to 200 million years actually back in um, history. And I wanna show you a short video here from an expedition that I went on about three years ago. Here we go. So this is the drill ship Joy this Resolution. This is a ship that can drill into the ocean crust, hundreds and thousands of feet. And here you see the drill operation, actually the drill rig will come now. And you see that this is actually where the sediments get extracted from the ocean floor. It's really a floating drill rig. Um, these are these long 30 feet metal barrels that we actually um, 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 get the sediments in and then we pull the liner out and then split those apart and see for the first time the mud, you know, from a million and 6.237 thousand years ago, um, which is true exploration and really exciting actually to see. Um, and what do we do then after we actually recover these cores? We do pretty much what Darwin did. We take discrete samples from these archives and then run them through the machinery of these geochemistry labs at Le Monde that allow us essentially to measure any element that you can think of of the periodic table of elements. And I wanna show you now a few data sets actually. Um, from these cores that were shown in the um, video, um, this is really sort of cutting edge off, fresh off the machine stuff that's not published yet. But this is a dust flux record now that runs from today to 5 million years ago. And it's a continuous record of the dust flux to that site in the South Pacific. Um, at any given time, that red line will tell you what the dust did at the time and what the global dust actually did um, at the time. This is currently the longest dust flux um, record that we have. And as you can tell, it shows a lot of variability over this time um, scale. So there's a lot of variation. I thought it's a little easier if we zoom in and actually see more detail. So this is now going from today to one million year ago. And the red line is that same site that I just showed you. And you see that it has this periodic cyclicity. This is not just random noise, right? There's this periodic cyclicity in that red record here going back to a million years. And what that is, is it follows the ice age cycles, which are this dominant climatic periodicity of our Earth history. Every time when we were in an ice age, in the grip of an ice age, dust fluxes are high when we are at a warmer stage, like you know, our present world, um, dust fluxes are low. And this is represented by the cyclicity in the signal. And we can, the blue one is actually another dust flux record from a completely different ocean basin. And you see how well it matches and how much of that synchronicity we see between these two records, which tells us this is really a global signal. Now you might say, hmm, 5 million years of dust, who cares? This is the reason why we care, because there's actually another factor that plays into why dust is important for the climate system. And that is that dust delivers nutrients, particularly to the ocean, also to the land, but particularly to the ocean. Dust is loaded with iron and large, vast regions of the ocean are actually starved for iron. And when I say staffed, I mean that there isn't much biology, not much biological activity in the surface ocean because there is not enough iron there. And when you have dust deliver iron to those um, ecosystems, they actually start to bloom and to grow. That's illustrated here. No iron, right, is this lower one with the open circles. As soon as you do add iron, 
there is sort of an explosion of life and you fertilize that ecosystem the same way you fertilize your backyard with iron, essentially. It's really the very same idea. You give them that micronutrient that these organisms have been waiting for and that generates phytoplankton growth. And just like everything else that grows, um, it does photosynthesis and draws down CO2 from the atmosphere, um, just like trees do. And about half of the global productivity is actually in the ocean. So that's a huge part of the global um, biological system. And so this is why the drawdown of CO2 is why these changes in the iron that we've seen before, why they have uh, an impact on the climate system as a whole and on the carbon, on the CO2 concentration in the atmosphere. And that led actually this guy who originally sort of hypothesized this, John Martin, to that saying, you know, give me half a tank of iron and I'll give you an ice age. Mm. Um, and this is sort of the idea behind something that some of you might have heard that there is also this idea out there that we could engineer the system by adding artificially iron to the ocean, that this could be one way of actually mitigating climate change and mitigating the buildup of carbon from fossil fuel uses from our messy fossil fuel uses as an artificial way of drawing down CO2 into the ocean by essentially mimicking what dust does, but multiplying that by, by, by orders of magnitude and using it to our um, advantage. And while I've mostly talked about sort of the neutral scientific history of dust, this is, I believe, you know, where sort of the rubber hits the road as in sort of my science hits the ethics of dust in a sense that these are very complex ethical decisions that need to be made. Um, there needs to be research into the side effects, of course, of these ideas. But there's also sort of a broader societal discussion to be had to, you know, before we even think of doing this. Um, and I'll stop here and thank you very much for listening and I'm excited to hear. I, I want to thank Pamela and uh, Joseph and the, the Center um, uh, for Science and Society for this invitation. This is this is so exciting. This this rarely happens, you know, mostly teaching uh, at Columbia is avoiding other faculty members. So, you know, <laughs> uh, this is really great to be able to have a, a conversation. And, and uh, one of the nice things of the, this climate school happening is that a lot of people are having conversations. So I, I approach this from a, an interest in, in monuments. And of course, monuments have been really affected by pollution and pollution that comes from industrial processes, but also just from the act of making buildings, because every building requires not only a lot of energy to be made, but we got to heat them up. So there's no architecture without energy consumption, without pollution. And this is the pollution in Pittsburgh, which was the, the place where all the steel to make architecture was made. So that is an intense production of, of um, particulate uh, matter in the air, like to such an extent that the sun didn't shine in Pittsburgh for like 100 years. You know, people complain that and you have complaints that, there, that the sun was being blocked already in the early 19th century, 1803 you know, people writing to the city council and real problems with kids, you know, just not getting enough sun, no vitamin D, health problems with, um, with uh, lung disease. So when we look at dust, we tend to have a very negative attitude towards it because we associate it with disease and we associate it with problems. But I've just been fascinated by it. I've been fascinated by the way that it layers on buildings and I, um, really found it beautiful. So I've, I've been really interested in just the way that it deposits here. You see some uh, crusts of, of dust on a, on a detail of a facade, but then, you know, some incredible patterns that it makes as it washes off the surface of, of buildings over, over time. Um, here, lunch. this is actually the Ghostbusters. If you know the Ghostbusters fire station, this is, <laughs> this is it. And then they, they cleaned it. I, I'm, I'm, you know, my gallery in Tribeca is across the street from it. So I'm, you know, uh, fond of it and they cleaned it. And I was just so upset because I thought, you know, why didn't they call me? I could have <laughs> saved that stuff. Um, 
But of course, the minute that we had the industrialization and in 19, you know, really in the 1940s and 50s, after all of the American industrial production for the war dies down, people start cleaning facades. And these facades had been dirty from the get go. They've been dirty since the 19th century. And a lot of those building materials like glazed terracotta were developed in order to prevent the building from decaying from that dust. But people started thinking, oh, we're gonna bring it back to the, its original condition by cleaning it. But in fact, there was never that original condition to be clean. But the pressure, the feeling that dust was negative, was was dirty, um, was something that people felt so strongly that there were just these enormous campaigns in the 50s and 60s and going into the 70s to clean Pittsburgh, clean New York, clean Boston, clean Paris. And, and mayors loved this stuff because it made them very visible right away. But a whole layer of history was destroyed. And this is interesting for me because the, the discipline that I teach in preservation really emerged because a lot of money went into these facade, quote unquote, cleaning and conservation projects. So the rise of preservation as a discipline really came out of this, for me, destruction of a really important historical record, which, which, was, which was laying flat on these facades. And I think, you know, whereas uh, Gisela, you look kind of vertically, I, I look horizontally, you know, I, I look at this very, thin moment, which I guess is, you know, 1800s to the present that just layered on top of these facades. And I haven't, you know, while I'll talk a little bit about my approach to this has been through art. I mean, that, that, that I, I haven't really, you know, I've just been awed by all the scientific research and the methodologies for collecting dust. My methodology was really one of cleaning these surfaces. So I was trying to look for a way to clean and I was invited to the Victoria and Albert Museum to do a project in relationship to their collection. This is one of their largest objects. This is a cast of Trajan's Column, which was made in the 19th century because they already figured that Trajan's Column was, was decaying because of industrial pollution. So they actually made a cast to preserve it. And then when they brought it to London, they put it on a smokestack. They commissioned the people that were building smokestacks to build a smokestack to put these Cast and to me, this was this absurd moment where the the symbol of pollution was being used to to uh, be the backdrop or the backstage of a of an object that was meant to prevent uh, or deal or preserve an object from the effects of pollution. So this kind of paradoxical object. It's the largest object in their collection, and what I did was to cast the interior. Um, uh, let me see if I can get to that. If we can, there's the. Uh, using essentially um, latex, so it's a it's a poultice. It's a um, it's it's a, a thick poultice that then goes onto the surface of the of the building, and as it dries, it starts to evaporate and 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 uh, polymerizes, and so it uh, becomes like a skin, and as the water evaporates, it pools the dust from the surface because the water can't evaporate into the wall it evaporates out of the wall so that's what it um uh, that's how it, it kind of mechanically absorbs the uh the surface and so here um if we can go forward uh, then you can see once it's dry how we you know that how how i can pull it off and it just becomes a skin like that and you can get a real sense of Kind of the tactility of it, and, and it's very, very, it's it, it, it's very tensile, has a lot of strength, and it really pulls that surface off the the. Um, so this is this is the final result. This is the dust of the interior of Trajan's column, put right next to Trajan's column. And for me, it was very important to show this pollution next to this room because this is the cast courts where things were created so that people that didn't have the money to go travel all around Europe could go there in an afternoon and see the greatest hits of European culture. And for me, it was important to put pollution amongst those greatest hits to say, you know, we couldn't have all of these wonderful works of art without making pollution. And we can't think of pollution as being external to culture. You know, pollution is part of our culture. So how do we deal with it? It seemed to me that starting aesthetically to appreciate it as a material, not as a, not as an abstraction was really important. And I think the distinction that Gisela made um, is very um, 
important because most people don't get that distinction. Most people say, oh, pollution is bad for the environment. And they don't realize that greenhouse gases and, and particulate dusts do different things uh, in, in the environment. So these are really very heavy particles. This is a, this is a work, I think when you start looking for dust and you start seeing it everywhere, like there it is, right? And then uh, Art History 101, so uh, these are industrial workers are taking a bath because it's Sunday, all the industry is closed, but there's one that's actually pumping out smoke, which was of course the site where I got commissioned to do a work. That was the factory of Mr. Louis Vuitton. And that's, that's where that chimney stack, he was working on Sundays. Um, that's his house on the left, his factory on the right. This is the famous site of the Louis Vuitton, you know, steamer trunks that helped to colonize Africa and, and make a transatlantic trade and so on. But this, I was commissioned to do this for the entrance to their new museum in Paris. And what I showed was the pollution that this factory made, you know. So they were very courageous to show what, you know, Marx would call a constitutive externality as part of their um, museum. So, of course, you know, we know that pollution, these sulfuric rains uh, have to really bad effects on art and on architecture. And artists have been fighting pollution since the 19th century. By the way, this is one of the first environmental uh, protection nonprofits, the Coal Bacon Society, founded by an artist. Because artists look very closely at their environment. And I've been particularly interested in John Ruskin, who looked very closely at buildings and the way that buildings decayed. And this building in particular, the Doge's Palace, the site of the, 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 the Doge, the, the ruler of the Venetian Empire, which lasted a thousand years. And uh, it's been cleaned and over cleaned, but there was one, one wall, that wall that nobody could see that had not been cleaned. And so here we are for the Venice Biennial cleaning that wall and making this cast um, of it. And so here, this is actually clean, but you can see the difference with the cleaning, with the power washing that, that, that they do. This, the cleaning here is gray, still the patina of the stone is still there, whereas the power washing really takes the whole thing off. And the thing for me that is uh, important is that I, I, I jump into projects, I do them, and then I learn something from the process. And what I learned here was uh, something that I wasn't anticipating, these little black lines that came out of the process uh, was actually the repair of a mortar over here that had fallen off and the conservators had neatly painted that black to match the existing wall. And of course, as it turned out, I spoke to some of my colleagues who were working across the street. In across the street, this building over here is actually the, the, um, the mint of the Venetian Empire. This is where they made their money. And as it turns out, they were cleaning it as well. And they, were, they had their scaffolding up, but they found out that all that that looks like pollution on it was actually painted by artists in the 19th century. And I was like, okay, so I found this little paint on this and artists had painted that. How, how come they painted their, the buildings black? Like, what's the story here? They said, well, we don't know why they painted them black, but we suspect that because the, the, most of the economy of Venice was British tourists who were coming from London, which was black, and they must have thought that black meant old. And so they gave it a little bit of an aging, you know, to make things look a little bit older. So they put up the scaffolding and then they, they took the scaffolding down and they it looked just the same because they decided they were not going to clean it because that was, you know, made by an artist and now made, made by pollution. So... To me, what was important lesson was that if an artist decides that, that this is art, that pollute, that you, you know, then that they'll save it. But if, but if it's considered to be a kind of global, abstract product of our collective work, then it gets taken off. So that thought to me was very important. You know, what is the collective work that we do together? This is a project done uh, in. Uh, uh, an aluminum factory in the north of Italy. This is going back up this uh, now in April. Um, a work that this was a, a, a building that really was the site of collective work. And the dust on this building is the site of that, of that collective uh, story. So that for me, I think dust tells a bigger story than just the story of one person. So these works are both, of course, mine, but they also, what I'm interested in is the larger stories they tell. And this project, which was commissioned by a um, museum in the south of Spain, 
really opened my mind up and really began to intersect with a lot of the work that, that you do, Gisela. Um, this is an ancient Roman mine. This is what's left of an ancient Roman mine in Spain. This is where the Romans made, uh, they conquered Spain during the Punic Wars because they were after the Carthaginian silver because the bigger their empire got, the more money they needed, the more denarii, maybe that was the name of these coins that they had, uh, they were standardized silver coins and they needed enough to put some in everyone's pocket because that's how you got people to be part of your system was to make sure they were part of your economy. So they were incredible engineers and they just turned mountains inside out. They hydraulically fracked all of these mountains. So, and it's a moonscape still. And so I did these casts of, this, um, of these mines not, you know, very intuitively trying to clean them. And uh, this was actually exhibited in, in uh, Australia because in Australia, they have a very strong uh, interest in mining because they provide all of the, um, all of the um, coal, not all, but uh, most of the coal that is burned in China, it actually comes from Australia. So they are, the two economies are, are joined at the hip. So they were very interested in kind of extraction of coal and, and, the, produ and, and, and the production of and mining in particular. So this was actually shown there. But as it turns out, the Australians are also very good at isotope analysis. And they had done uh, one of these isotope analysis of the, of the um, cores in, in Greenland and found that the dust from the very mine that I had cleaned was also up in up in the uh, up up in the North Pole, essentially, and that blew my mind. I mean, that really blew my mind because, first of all, it it really pushed my chronology of what it means to be modern down to the Roman Empire, back to the Roman Empire. I'd always thought, oh, mine is a nineteenth and twentieth century project. Because, you know, when you really look at this, the distance is pretty long, you know, it, it's quite a ways there, you know, it's, it's like a seven hour flight to get from Spain to, to, to the, but actually it's more like, you, if you think of the wind pattern, you have to go all the way to South America and back up and up to the North Pole to deposit that dust that comes from Spain up there. So actually the Romans had already polluted the world's atmosphere. And that kind of changed everything for me to think that, that the Romans who were at the height of their empire, 70 million people, and who had an average age of like 20 years old, you know, they kind of, they died young, um, that to keep that empire going, that, that, the, that just making money, just making money to keep that empire going polluted the world. And so it helped me kind of grasp the, the level at which we are working, you know, now we're almost 8 billion people, we live close to 80 years, you know, or more. And so I, I got really interested in this question of, of money, you know, just like our society today, like the money that we have to make in order to stay together. And so this was the US Mint where all of the gold from the gold rush was processed into coins. And so I, this was, of course, one of the few buildings that survived the San Francisco earthquake of 1907. That's why everything else around it is a ruin. Uh, they don't know what to do with the building. It's kind of empty. They call it a cultural center, but there's not much culture happening inside. Uh, and so those are the chimneys at the attic level, which had never been cleaned. And so we, you know, we cleaned those and made two rooms. These are at SF MoMA now. Um, and their environments, you can actually go into these chimneys and experience all of this dust and kind of see it as a material. Because for me, I think it's very important to have this kind of emotional, tangible relationship with pollution, that it's not an abstraction, that it's not somewhere else, that it's not something that is other people's problems, that it, this is everywhere around us. And all you have to do is look, it's everywhere on the Columbia campus. Um, so I started to think about monuments as being everywhere. Uh, can this help me rethink my own practice? You know, can it help me rethink the idea of preservation? Because we tend to think of monuments as being all in one place, all in one time, you know, on the lot line. But then, of course, there really aren't. You know, so the Berlin Wall, this is a picture of the Berlin Wall. This is 
where's Waldo? You know, where is the Berlin Wall? It's all over the world. Like some of the most important monuments in the world have been distributed. The Berlin Wall is in London. There you have it next to a little parking lot. Uh, there you have it at the University of Berlin. I'm sorry, I have the University of Virginia, the Berlin Wall, nice little side of that. But also, you know, it's already in, in um, other, other monuments like the Parthenon are also distributed all over the world. So um, there you have it in Athens. Actually, if you go to Athens and you try to go see the Parthenon, you don't see it up on the Acropolis because it's, it's in London it, and the pieces that they had, they moved down the hill to this museum. So all the pieces of the, the valuable pieces of the, of the Parthenon are not where it's supposed to be. So monuments are everywhere, um, they're distributed. And so it made me start thinking of monuments as distributed monuments. And this is part of the work that I've been doing recently in uh, this last project that I'll show you um, in the, uh, I have one minute left um, at the British Parliament, a site that really, we owe a lot of what we think about democracy to this site. This is where the first king was, you know, the first regicide, the, the, the king that tried to become an absolute ruler was, judged by the law of the land to be guilty of treason and, and, and decapitated. And so our idea of a, a new president every four years really comes from that. And this was the place that really British really tied to that place so that when, it, when the whole place went on fire, they came out to protect it and it had never been clean. So we collaborated with parliamentary estates um, uh, commissioned by Art Angel, which is a public art fund. This is a midway through our cleaning process where we use the same technique to, we had to do it in little sections and take it off site, but then we reinstalled it inside of Westminster Hall. This building is a thousand years old. It's been in continuous use as the site of government. And for me, what was important was that, you know, if you see these plaques on the floor that says, you know, this is where King George lied in state. This is where Queen Elizabeth died, you know, like Winston Churchill lied in state there. So, but to, these are the stories of big politicians. This is telling the history of humanity through big political rulers. And for me, what was important is to tell our collective history. And our collective history is a history of the environment. It's a, it's a history of the climate in our strange moment where now kind of inadvertently we find ourselves having kind of changed our environment in a way that was unintentional. Like we were happy when our changes were intentional. We were clear cutting forests and making cities and making architecture. And that was okay because we seem to be in control. And now that we are um, making these large changes to the environment that we don't seem to control, I think we are a little bit more worried. But what ended up happening with all of this, I think that for me is interesting is that they, these Dust, in a sense, picks up different meanings in different contexts. And, and, and art, I think, begins to open that up. You know, what is the meaning of, what, of dust? What is our behavior? Because ethics, in a way, is also about how do we behave in certain situations. And we open this show the day of Brexit. So it, it, by pure coincidence, the vote came in the same day. So this became associated with the Brexit vote. And... Um, and so it acquired a, a lot of meaning as a kind of shroud for Brexit and so on. So what ended up happening was that the work was cut into pieces and distributed to all of the nations of the United Kingdom, to Wales, to museums in Wales, Northern Ireland, uh, um, England and Scotland. And so um, in a way it brought the dust back to other places. And so it's this back and forth between the dust settling on monuments, picking up new meaning, and now being moved again to new locations where they can begin to tell stories that are not necessarily overdetermined by the stories of the buildings where they come from, but are also linked to these larger political and environmental stories, um, which, I, which for me is very important to emphasize that this history of the environment that we're talking about is also a political and technological history. Right? These are decisions that are made by governments and by uh, as much as uh, they, they, these are not, you know, these, these don't just happen. So uh, I'll stop there and we can kind of turn to the conversation. Uh, thank you very much for your attention.
Okay, if um, Dr. Finker and um, Professor Otero Pilos would like to come and sit right here and pursue a conversation. One of the things that really captivates me about what you do is just the, the nature of the aggregation of knowledge over time, just your ability to build these archives as a scientific community, and then to put these records together. You know how you do that because of course you get a sample from this part of the ocean and you get a sample from that part of the ocean this sample is whatever 100 meters long and this one's three meters long how do you say this layer matches that layer so that you can begin you know what i mean yeah, like yeah. How, do, how do you do that um that is an excellent question um so the way we do it is we come up with the relationship between depth and age for each of the sites, and then re related by age. But that's sort of the simple answer. Um, that's really also the tricky part of it, you know, because it's not trivial to figure out a way of dating, we call this dating, um, dating these sediments, you know, at, at depth. But that's the vehicle because you're right, in depth space, it can be completely different from site to site, right? Even like two sites next to each other, you know, half a kilometer next to each other can have a completely different history of accumulation. Um, in the, I, you know, to sort of the, what you also showed with the ice cores, um, ice cores can be dated very, very well, you know, really exceptionally well. You can actually see every year in the ice core, you can just count like a tree ring, you know, tree rings, the same thing, right? You can count the years. Um, in marine sediments, it's a little bit more tricky. There's different ways of doing it. You have radioactive clocks, you know, where you have an element that decays and you know how fast it decays and then you can bring that together and that gives you an age and you have tuning to sort of given time ranges. And that's where it actually gets to almost a philosophical question because often we do this, we have one record that we think is, you know, um, sort of the reference and then we tune everything into that reference. But what if there is a mistake, you know, or something that's not oh, quite right. tunable in that? So yes, there is a lot of stuff that builds on top of each other. And that's part of the beauty of science. I think that it really accumulates knowledge it's slow and there's a lot of inertia and it's very conservative that accumulation but there is accumulation but also there's sometimes that risk that we sort of think something is true but don't quite because of this conservative nature really challenge it i, I was wondering you know so in light of that at a certain point everybody agrees that this is the right methodology for collecting let's say dust right mm -hmm. um do an ice core sample. Um, I, I, I think you're, I mean, I really admire that, but how did that happen? Like, how did everyone come to, you know, just from a historical standpoint, you know, now we all seem to be very comfortable with that idea, but how did it, how did that come to pass? Like, how did we go from Darwin just, seems like he was just like, or oh, what the hell, I'll collect a little bit of this dust and see what happens, <laughs> right? Like, yeah, he didn't take sediments, right? This is really from the ship, I think, straight off the ship. Right, I'm yeah. so cool. But That's um, more like what I do, but I, I guess maybe that didn't <laughs> exactly. go anywhere. So right? you should, you can have that slide. <laughs> <laughs> but why did he do that? I yeah, think why it's part of the question. I think you know, because why? they were, you know, I honestly- He was yeah. collecting everything. Yeah, and it destroyed their instruments, and they were all of a sudden, you know, in that um, dust storm. I think that, and then he uh -huh. connected it, you know, to have it. Um, Maybe. But I, I agree. This is a little different. Maybe try to index it to some place eventually, because they were out in the middle of the ocean, right? And yeah. where was that dust coming from? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, how did it happen? I, I think you know, the, like taking sediment cores has been done for a long time. Um, but like it really took off maybe in the last 30, 40 years, you know, sort of in that that's sense it. of Italian climate, that, that's pretty much it. Um, so it's not that there's a hundreds of years old tradition you know, of, of, of doing this. Wow, 
but that's news to me. I didn't know that. Can I ask a question? <laughs> uh, but Gisela, I don't want to um, preclude you from asking something if you have something to ask of um, Jorge first. I mean, in terms of the method, you know, because I've seen one of the shows up in Terrytown, um, but is it always really the same method that you're using? How did you find that, you know, that type of latex that allows you to completely preserve that and not yeah. contaminate it? I try to use the same method because there's a part of me that, that, that has the aspiration to be somewhat scientific about art. Um, but I, you know, I think about that because there has been a tradition in preservation of using different kinds of materials to try to essentially loosen the dust on the side, you know, because it's encrusted in there and you have to get it off somehow. Mm -hmm. And one of the ways you get it off is you get it wet over a long enough period of time that it just starts to kind of dissolve a little bit. And so people used mud and they use paper mache and then, you know, in the 21st century, people started experimenting with latex because it just became more available as a, as a um, you know, as a cheap, you know, material. And so the material be became the device for cleaning. So it, 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 it has its own problematic history that kind of, you know, latex and the latex trees and the colonial plantations, which I've, you know, become more and more aware of over time. Um, in fact, every material that you look at, you know, is, is a whole, you know, and a history of how that material is, is, is collected and so on and sourced. But yeah, I try to use the same material because I mean, what I am thinking about is that there can be some kind of archiving you know, uh, I'm trying to save that dust. You know, ultimately that's what I'm trying to do because for, for most of my colleagues, that dust has absolutely no meaning and absolutely no, no sense. No, and, and so I'm trying to bring meaning and, and sense to the dust as a way to, um, to try to create a, a picture of, um, well, hang on, this is a post-rationalization. <laughs> to be honest, I mean, uh, to be perfectly honest, this is a complete post-rationalization because I didn't really start this way, right? But now that I'm there, you know, I'm trying to think about what the hell did I do, you know? Um, and so I kept thinking of the fact that, well, now I have all of these pieces of dust from all around the world and they have more of a relationship to each other um, than... To, they still have a relationship to the buildings where they come from, but they also have a new relationship to each other. And that I became very interested in, you know, it's almost like reverse engineering a monument, you know, from, and there, I think there's a kind of connection to what you do because you're taking all these samples or maybe I've been inspired by what you do. You know, you take all these samples and then you try to reverse engineer the earth, you know, try to figure out, okay, how, what happened here? And so you have this, image of the earth that we didn't have before. Uh, and, and I guess I'm interested in that in terms of an idea of a monument, you know, can I arrive at an idea of a monument that is a different idea than what I started with, which was a monument is a stable thing that sits on the site that it's always there. Uh, and now to me, that doesn't hold true as much, you know. Dust for me is the monument. You know? That's the monument. Um. Okay, can I ask my question? I'm realizing that my the people are actually asking questions on my computer and also here. So that's gonna be kind of complicated. So let me just ask a question and then I'll look at the chat. Um, I, you know, you both talked about the ethics, the story and ethics of dust. And, um, you know, I think your sense of ethics is what you mean by that is slightly different. And I'd like you to just, um, you know, say, make really explicit what you mean by the ethics of dust and then, then discuss. <laughs> you should start off because it's really good. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I'm stuck with it. Um, now I have the book of dust. Well, so. well okay. So the ethics of dust is, um, 
it's a, it's a title that I use to in 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 a way in, to pay homage to John Ruskin, who mm -hmm. who wrote a book in the middle of the 19th century called The Ethics of the Dust. And since for me, the dust seemed a little bit too singular, I just took out that the <laughs> and I called it the ethics of dust. And uh, but he was very interested in the way that dust is a cycle. And that was a book, it's a fascinating little book on mineralogy and the formation of rocks and how different kinds of dust crystallize into different kinds of rocks. And so he was drawing a social analogy between the way that different dusts crystallize into either very rigid patterns to more, you know, like metamorphic rocks or, you know, quartz crystals. These have different shapes. They're more orderly or more disorderly. And so he was drawing he was a very a bit quick on his feet, you know, and, and said, this is a lesson for how society works. There are different kinds of people. And so he was making the analogy that dust is people and that, that people come together around different ideas. Some are more kind of square, some are more loosey, you know, and they are, and, and but what was interesting about him is that he saw that, that there was always conflict between these different positions and ideas. And so he talked about the, he was very interested. He had an incredible mineral collection and the, and the pieces he was most interested in were the ones that had two minerals kind of, you know, going at it as they crystallize and pushing for space. And um, I think that's a little bit problematic and I wouldn't want to follow him to this jump, this logical jump between dust and social behavior. Um, so my understanding of ethics is not, it's not his understanding, but I thought that was an important background to give in terms of where this, this project is coming from, because, um, you know, we are always trying to draw lessons from, from nature. Uh, we're always trying to figure out who we are as part of nature. That's what Ruskin was trying to do. Um, but, but for me, um, today, the question of ethics is, is, is about, not so much, you know, going from an observation of this is the way things are. Um, uh, I think that's very interesting. This is, this is what we can observe. Ruskin very quickly jumped to, therefore, this is the way things should be. You know, there is no way to get out of this idea of society as a perpetual conflict and so on. But I, I kind of leave it at the observation and, and what, I've become very interested in is not so much dust own behavior, but our relationship, our behavior towards mm -hmm. dust, the, the ethical questions that we raise around dust um, and how we, how we make value judgments mm -hmm. about what is okay and what is not okay. And dust has a tendency to fall on the not okay side most of the mm -hmm. time. Mm -hmm. You know, we. Yeah. Do you want to say what your ethics of? Yeah, there, yeah. Um, I, I, you know, do want to point out that, right? I was inspired by that title that we then combine sort of with the mm -hmm. history piece and there's sort of two answers to your question. You know, when I put together this talk, I sort of naturally thought about that this is really an interface of where I work and what sort of these societal questions are about doing something about climate change and mm. you know mitigating the the, the climate-related problems that we are in. Um, but I think also there is a lot of overlap, you know, from my conversation, from what you were just saying, sort of the same questions, right? How do we learn from nature? How do, right, when you said that, right? How does nature, does it want to tell us something or not, right? Are we taking advantage of it or not? And, and I think the other level of this is that I have become, after doing this type of science that's purely sort of 
mostly focused on telling the history, sort of the neutral, non-political, non-historical, just facts of science, I've become more and more interested in all these interfaces to other places. I think partly of my own interest, but also partly because I feel, I feel that we as a community, you know, all of us here, we as a science community, but also we as Columbia, we as climate school, whatnot, whatever, right, have are sort of asked to, to respond and really do something about, you know, the climate problem. And this is where I've sort of pondered all these ethical questions. You know, what does that really mean? And I'm, I also know of the sort of the, the conflict of, you know, pulling back and just doing sort of my day job or sort of pulling forward or pushing forward and thinking about sort of outside of these borders. And that's, that's sort of my definition of the ethics of dust in that sense, really yeah, in the sense you, of, yeah, sorry. No, go, go ahead. You left us with the slide about dumping iron into the ocean. And that does seem like a major question, um, you know, any sort of climate mitigation, climate change mitigation um, is a huge question, not just scientific, but obviously part of it is possibly ethical. Um, and that's what I thought you were alluding to. Yeah, and that certainly is, this question of dust, good or bad, you know, dust actually cools us off. But on the other hand, you know. Yeah, it's killing millions of people every yeah. year, right? So as, as pollution and impacts on public health. And yes, it's this whole conglomerate. But I, what, what I, I did this intentionally leave it, you know, at the very end, because that's what I want to initiate is sort of that type of discourse that, goes through these different spheres and, and makes us think really outside, it sounds like a cliche, but, but I hope that this series does and our conversations do. Yeah. To, to me, it's fascinating if I could just dovetail on that because, you know, obviously, I mean, maybe it's important to draw a distinction between ethics and morals, you know, like the, the, this is not a moralizing, this is what we should do, this is not what we should do, but the, the ethics is really more of a, can we talk about this? You know, can, can, can we talk about the issues here? You know, that that I think is the ethical uh, process in a way, and it, it's also about in that discourse thinking about how we make decisions together, which is the the basics of politics. You know, this is how we come together to make a decision um, in in the best form uh, is that, and so. When you think about the dumping of, 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 of iron dust, it seems to raise all sorts of ethical questions because we see ourselves as having the, the, the button you know, to do it. We're like, oh yeah, that's something we could pro probably do and, I, and somebody could make that decision, right? Like some, but, and so it puts us over here in terms of that discussion, but at the same time, what we did since the 19th century was everyone was pushing the buttons, exactly. pushing the button. <laughs> and we kind of knew that it was, you know, but since it was little aggregate, you know, things, and it was, it didn't feel like it was a collective decision, and it didn't also feel like we had to make a decision. It was just a kind of what we called progress, you know, we just did it, and. Uh, and so we didn't ask questions whether this progress is actually a problem. So if you developed a system where everybody uh, would like get around the world by producing iron dust and you know travel on the ocean and there were all this iron dust started getting dumped, but everybody just didn't have to think about it. They were just traveling on the ocean, having a great time. Maybe that, you know, that's how it, <laughs> but um, I think that it's the, in a way, dust helps us think about the aggregate nature of action, um, and 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 where we are at today is is in a way a, a, a response to all of that. Like we, so when we think about new concepts, new ideas, that's what for me is very interesting, and where I see the connection between art and science is that ideas require lateral thinking that, that really require making connections sideways rather than up and down our disciplines. Um, and I don't know how we do it except to play around 
a bit. Um, allow ourselves the, the opportunity to have conversations like this where we kind of don't know where this is all going and it's okay, <laughs> you know. Um, that, that's what I feel is very important. And the university is really not set up for that kind of playful connecting because it's all incredibly path determined and you know, research is product oriented. And I, 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 I think that's a real problem because we are not gonna actually come up with anything new if all we do is follow the path that we've already been on. So, um, and it's not just we, it's also right, the people who we teach, for example, you know, who are sort of stuck in our linearity. Right? I think that's the other piece of this, that we need to find new ways of also having a discourse and teaching these topics. Okay, I want to open it up. Um, do we have questions from the floor? We have a couple of questions in the chat. Um, yes, please. Thanks a lot. So I have a very mundane question about the history of the science cleaning, which you mentioned as this incisive moment, right? Black and black and blacker and dust accumulates. And then you say there's this moment when cities decide this is not the way the buildings should look like. Yeah. Um, and preservation as a field becomes more important. And I was wondering if you could speak a little bit more about this moment in history and when you see that shift coming about and what do you think the reasons are for it, but also just um, how exactly it developed, like who are the drivers, where did this history of understandings of what cities should look like come from, um, are there points of origin and then others pick up on it? Um, yeah. Just a broad picture. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Well, very, I'd say, um, so in, in the, like say, there's different things in different countries, but very quickly, for example, in France, because they are, very centralized and the, the government is in Paris and has makes the minister of culture in France in the 50s was a man called Andre Malraux and who was a you know he was a very interesting figure and he made a policy that we got to start cleaning and so he made it into policy and Paris went from being black to being white uh, people bemoaned it and, you know, all the existentialists thought that this was ruining the spirit of Paris and, but they did it and they got tourism and they thought that this was Pittsburgh went about it. The mayor went about it. Uh, New York was more kind of as usual developer driven. Uh, but it, it's like at a certain point, it's just the thing you do when you have an old building and you want to demonstrate that you're taking care of your environment the standard solution became by the mid late 1950s, early 60s, clean it. And there's no reason to clean it. There's absolutely no reason to clean it. That dust is doing nothing on the building. I mean, unless you go lick it, you know, <laughs> but I haven't seen a lot of people licking buildings, you know. Uh, okay, I think we're gonna take, if it's okay, if I just go to some other questions, we're running short on time, people are beginning to leave. Go ahead. Yeah, let's actually raise all the questions at once and hopefully it will. Um, yeah. Please. Yeah, I feel like today is a very, very eye opening uh, lecture between science point of view and also our point of view. And I feel like for me today, um, I think like the common value for all of today is like layer matters. And I feel like in the scientific point of view, is like to see the, different, the difference between different layers and to ask questions why that difference happens. And for artistic, I feel like just to kind of peel the layer and ask the question, why this layer values? Like, I'm not sure I, I understand you know, correctly. And also I have a question about like, how do you think you dip into the, for example, the similar question, but like, how do you think you are uh, different between these two? Okay, great, thank you. Um, we'll put all the tables, all the questions on the table. Yeah, I was just gonna ask if you have thoughts or a certain perspective around um, you know, in relation to the idea of, you know, putting more iron into the ocean, I, I thought that was really neat to hear, and I hadn't heard that approach. I'm thinking of, like, you know, ocean acidification, which in intense amounts of carbon, you know, dioxide in the atmosphere being absorbed by the ocean, and if that, you know, it definitely has a layer of complexity, and I'm just curious in your thoughts around that. 
Yeah. Okay. So let's go to layers. How do you both think about them? Use them, I guess. Is that you want to do accurate? The layers and like the other. Um, yeah. I mean, I guess I work with one layer, which is um, kind of layer, um, which which is the. It, which I thought really was the layer of the 19th and 20th century of industrialization. But as it turns out, industrialization is a lot older than that. Um, so I, I kind of, I guess I work kind of in the layer, you know, uh, this kind of horizontal, um, but I'm, I'm very interested in, in, there's a really wonderful 19th century book called Flatland I don't know if you've, some of you might have read this, and it's basically a, it's a science fiction book in which everybody lives inside of a plane, inside of a, inside of a two-dimensional plane, and so everything is dismissed, and they can only see distance, and they can recognize each other by their movements, but then at a certain point, a sphere comes in and goes through this two-dimensional plane, and nobody can make sense of this thing, because all they see is a line. Um, and so it takes them moving outside of that plane to be able to see things. And so it's about how moving from one dimension to another gives you another perspective. So um, I, I definitely appreciate, I, I'm within the layer, you know, I have a heart, but, but I, I've tried to get kind of this so that you can see the layer, right? So you can get outside the layer and look at it. Um, maybe you're more in the layer than I, I'm not sure, like, because you guys are looking this way. Right, like people, um, yeah, I, I don't see it as that different yeah. actually because in your layer, what you call the layer, there's also time, yeah, yeah, right. There's a lot of time actually in your very thin layer, there's so much time, there's layer over layer over layer, and I think it's really equivalent, sort of, to how I think of time in a, a vertical um sediment core, for example, you know. Yeah, we're both um, working on time in one way or another, yeah. We're both um, working on human history, you know? History, exactly. Yeah, right. I mean, and the way that people have made decisions in the past to, um, you know, to create societies which actually do have an idea of progress. Um, and, you know, you can see that idea actually coming to fruition in the layers um, that you both study. I mean, with different intensities at different times. Yeah. So it's, um, yeah. Okay, um, then the second question was about dumping iron into the ocean. Yeah, I, there, I, there are many questions about it in the chat, actually. Everybody's about dumping iron. Dump so, you know, let me first say, I'm not an advocate for dumping iron in the ocean. You know, I just sort of wanted to pose this at this nexus. And yes, you're absolutely right. It would nothing, right? The other carbon problem other than warming the world is ocean acidification, which dissolves carbonate in the ocean and doesn't allow certain eco, you know, corals and other carbon-based um, um, bugs to, to live. Um, um, so you're absolutely right that this is a problem. There's many, many other problems. Um, so my, I think my, my impetus here was to make us think about it, you know, and I still believe that even though climate change sort of pops up here and there in the media, um, we still don't really put our heads around it and thinking about these mitigation instruments such as dumping iron in the ocean or other um, what we call carbon dioxide removal techniques, CDR, you know, is the sort of fancy term for that. Um, and sort of thinking about how we can take processes from the natural world that we understand scientifically and that we can in that discourse between the humanities, the art, you know, and a few of scientists on the side, um, you know, sort of ponder and figure out what to do. Mm -hmm. But you're absolutely right. There's horrible side effects. We don't know what will happen. Um, you know, so there's, there's plenty of questions to be answered. No, I, yes, thank you for that. And I so admire and respect the provocation, you know, of imagination and thinking differently. Okay, more questions from the room. You're, did you? Yeah, I, no, I mean, I, I don't want yeah. I have thumbs up, but. <laughs> Go ahead. I was uh, just wondering where the two of you see yourselves in like, the history of your respective fields, because it seems like uh, 
your particular uh, brand of art and preservation sort of resets the clock on these monuments. Like once you take a layer off, it's sort of it's making the moment at which you did that sort of a year one, at which point eventually this can be done again in the future, I imagine. Uh, For collecting more dust, is that what you mean? Yes. Like you're cleaning up. Whereas it doesn't seem, obviously that's not the nature of your work, but you are at this sort of moment uh, where you're looking forward to a new sort of, uh, it seems like a new sort of moment in, in the field when you're talking about, uh, you know, environmental engineering and things like that. So I was just wondering if you could speak to that. Uh, I mean, I, I can't, I, I, I guess I'm too much of a historian to be able to tell you what my position in the history of my discipline is, because I think that's for future historians to determine whether there's any relevance in what I do personally, but, it, but I am enjoying what I'm doing, so <laughs> that matters to me very much. Um, and, um, you know, I, I, I think that for me, the challenge is that, um, you know, we spend a lot of time and effort and, and treasure, you know, in working on monuments. And so the story that we've been telling ourselves is we got to do this because these are culturally significant things and we know ourselves better if we, if we have these things around. Um, I, I think there can be more like these things can do a lot more work for us and one of the things i think they can do is to think of them as environmental sensors you know um that have been out a lot of these buildings are a thousand years old a couple thousand years old and so these are this is a really interesting time frame because my understanding is we have like like history of the environment is very clear 150 years to the present, right? Like, but then, and it's also very clear, like five million years ago at a big macro scale, like what you showed us. And so I'm very interested in like the last thousand years where people are looking at like pollen and, you know, like the tree ring. I mean, there's a lot of, so I think that buildings could, you know, monuments that have been sitting there. The only problem is they've been very manipulated. They've been very, you know, touched and acted upon, but there's still a lot of original dust in them. And I guess my thing is, it's paradoxical because I take it off, but my thing is leave it, you know, <laughs> leave it on, you know. When I go to these things, like, I, it's clear that it's gonna get taken off. So what I try to do is to save it. I'm like, okay, if you're, let's, if you're gonna take it off, let me do it. And at least we try to save it and put it in a museum and somewhere where it can still be, you know, accessible. So um, in terms of the, you know, comparing that to the core, um, to the ice cores in particular, and going off that question, really, you know, the last thousand years, is that something that you can track very exactly in ice cores so that you could tell the history of the last um, thousand, even a hundred years to see the kinds of changes that have happened since 1850, you know, since the huge... Yeah increase in um, human impact. Yeah, we, we can actually. Um, the most, like CO2, for example, carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, we have measurements since 1959 in the actual air. Mm -hmm. Before that, these measurements are from ice cores. Yeah. And they are perfectly dated uh -huh. because we have this layer dating from the ice cores. So yes, we can. The challenge with ice cores, you know, for a lot of other environmental and climatic variables, or other variables that are of interest is they sit on, they live on the poles. You know, they don't live where it actually matters, perhaps, you know, for certain types of uh, measurements, right? For these gases, they are well mixed in the atmosphere and the CO2 concentration in New York City is the same as the one on Greenland and as the one in Johannesburg, South Africa. So that's not a problem. For other variables, you know, it is very limited in the regional image that you can get from my course. Yeah. yeah. That's what I'm interested in. I'm interested in a little bit more of the finer grain, you know, of, of how was it different to, let's say, live in West Africa versus, you know, Beijing, you know. Uh, and yeah, can't get that from ice How yeah. can we find some sediments, you know? Uh, history. 
yeah. history. Yeah, there's some archival archives, texts, much more. Text. Text. Yeah, yeah. 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 Triangulate yeah. from yeah. all of that maybe, material. Maybe we can use your, you know, because it's very challenging actually to get good archives of the last thousand years. So you're definitely on something, you know, with a good dating, with good resolution. Um, that's much more tricky than, you know, from, from non ice cores. Um, I have a, po a postdoc working with me to start it, you know, who she wants to work on biomass from fires, you know, from natural fires to figure out, right, this key zero order question, do we have now more wildfires than 500 years ago? It's a non-trivial question. And, yeah. and so we are searching actually for archives that we can use to answer that question. That's fascinating. You mean historical archives? Yeah. 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 Or this I kind of sediment, you know, archives. You mean sediment archives or like I mean we have historical archives. We do we have those, right? And I know <laughs> the wall. Um, yeah, but we are trying to sort of do, do the equivalent work in yeah. sediments or lakes or bogs or you know, some other type of physical archive. Yeah to then match it up actually with historical. I think that that work between historians and climate scientists is really, really fruitful and interesting. There should be much more of it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. there's very little. Yeah. Right, there's sort of this, nip, um, this cherry picking, you know, if something yeah, fits, exactly. it gets told, but there is not really a, a, an intertwined exchange. Yeah, we have a, a climate, um, a, two people, a historian of African climate and a climate scientist working together in our environmental sciences and humanities cluster at Columbia. And they have events about once a month. Um, and what they found in comparing climate data and um, historical data, I mean, made by historians, um, it's very, very complex. <laughs> Pretty much we went away from that reading session with an idea of uh, it's really hard to know how to go forward. But it is, you know, that just means we need to do more work. Um, I, we're going to let you have the last word, um, Dr. Schaefer. Else. I think there's that no one else had their hand up. Okay, so I, I'm also a climate scientist. It was really fascinating for me when you kind of said that you're working vertically and that's completely different. But I, I'm almost embarrassed to say that, but if I see your walls and you take this dust off, for me, that's a climate archive. And you kind of think about laser ablation technique that can really kind of micrometer by micrometer take the dust off because, I mean, you have a thousand years, you know, that you have a thousand year of dust accumulation. Yeah. And it's just, a, for me, that's really kind of the same, it's just because of the monument and the architecture that the dust accumulates on a vertical surface. And it's not as in the natural, it's kind of driven by gravity and it's kind of either the sediment underneath the ocean or, 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 the, or the snow that, that comes from the ice sheet. So for me, that's kind of what was fascinating to see that, that uh, the different perspective there. But what I really am fascinated about, I mean, that's what's really fascinating. Scientists who always think in bias to think in papers. I mean, that would be so great if you can get a manuscript together about the, <laughs> the holistic of dust in general. It's kind of would be, would be fascinating. And I really like the idea of the kind of your pitch that dust is typically seen as something negative. And we, in a way, we kind of should get dust out of that corner because if, if you like it or not, as you said, pollution is part of our progress and we are kind of really good in behaving like we have nothing to do with it right? <laughs> because <laughs> while we are producing it which is kind of a very strange concept and <laughs> it's not acceptable but then there's also in this climate crisis that and the knowledge that we have to do something i mean net zero carbon emission by mankind will not happen so we need some kind of mitigation technique and dust is on the list of our rescue um, techniques. I'm not proposing that necessarily. I don't. Uh, we're far behind the, the the side effect science that we need to do much more. But anyway, it's there, and it could potentially it helps us already. Um, and it could, could really help us. And for me, that was kind of the seeing the bus getting in a really different light, and it's normally discussed, but it's really, really, really ethically very important. <laughs> 
Thank you. Well, thank you. You've really summed up the evening wonderfully. <laughs> I don't have any work to do here except to um, thank really deeply our two speakers. I have to say that, you know, this is exactly what I imagined would happen. I could go on talking, I mean, discussing, conversing for many hours still because this was really, really fascinating and it's really what we hope to accomplish to bring people together around interesting and what seemed unusual and unlikely um, kinds of objects of study and of creation and to um, have a conversation about it and see what comes out of it in terms of um, you know that pressing most pressing problem of our one of the most pressing problems of our time I should say um, climate change uh, so thank you all very much for coming. Um, thank you also to everybody on Zoom. Thanks very much for your thoughtful questions. And thanks especially to you two. But I also want to say thank you to the staff of the Center for Science and Society, who are Joseph Sulek, Darwin Ng, and Melinda Miller, and Carolyn Sherman, who really um, made this, brought this event into being with quite a lot of quite energetic work. So um, thank you to all of you. And um, really, deep thanks to thank you. both of you.